Now on to Charles, the reason that we've all come here today. We're really thrilled that you could make the effort to come all this way to speak to us today, Charlie. We, um, we couldn't believe it when you, when you gave us the thumbs up. I was going to begin with all Charles' academic, business and personal achievements, which are described inside the front cover of his book. Um, I haven't. It really is an unbelievable list and worth having a look at and demonstrates how passionate and dedicated Charlie is to the land and to agriculture in general. But instead of focusing on the past, I thought it's more relevant to focus on here and now. We're about to listen to a man who in researching and writing this book has gone against the trend and I'm sure raised more than a few eyebrows and ruffled a lot of feathers and I could imagine stretched friendships as well. There's no doubt that Call of the Red Warbler will go down in history as a real catalyst for changes in agricultural practices which are required to enable healthy and reliable food production going into the future. And the fact that we're all fortunate enough here to be here today to listen to the author of this book shouldn't be underestimated. Um, the success of the book, both in terms of numbers sold in countries that it has reached, is phenomenal. And I did a bit of sneaky background work and phoned the publisher this morning and they said that they're on to their eighth reprint of the book and that she didn't know how many countries, but at least five. So um, that's really a pretty amazing statistic. And I have to have a critical comment. The only critical comment I have about the book is the fact that you can't unread or unlearn the comments of the book. Um, no one's paid $22, including GST, to listen to me gathering on, so now I'll pass the microphone over to Charles. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jack, and uh, particular thanks to the Upper Hopkins Land Management Group and, and associated um, National Land Care and other catchment management groups. Uh, it's always great to talk to farmers. I'm doing a lot of it, and uh, particularly want to thank you guys for turning up today. Um, it's worthwhile me coming here because it's a balmy afternoon. We had a minus four frost this morning, which is the end of our growth. So. Uh, uh, I guess you guys need some rain to make some growth here as well. What I'm going to do today is um, take you on a quick canter across a broad field, but diving into a few details. It won't be two hours straight. Uh, uh, after the first sort of session, which will be a bit over half of my talk, probably have a five or ten minute break, I think, and then um, uh, get back into it after that. So uh, that's sort of the format. <coughs> date of birth issues here, I can operate this technolo t t technology, I'll be right. But look, um, the message is pretty simple. Um, there's a lot of issues confronting us uh, as a society and globally at the moment, um, whether it's earth systems, human health. Uh, and from my point of view, having travelled the world and done a lot of research and uh, talked to a lot of wonderful innovators, in my view, the best solutions to some of our really big issues are going to come from farmers and are coming from farmers, particularly the regenerative aspects, whether it's food, climate and other issues. And to me, that's enormously exciting. And so my message is pretty simple. From healthy landscapes, we get healthy food and fibre and healthy food and societies. When I'm talking about regenerative ag, I'm not going to go into the details, but as you can see up there, it's a range of uh, practices, not just grazing, biological farming, agroforestry, key lime, the whole aspect. So the key point I want to make is that the same principles apply. Uh, there are key landscape functions that I'm going to talk about and getting them healthy again, particularly healthy biologically active soils, is common to all those different practices. So by regenerative, I mean upward improvement in our landscapes and the way they function. So there's a big context. As you can see, those rats are discovering there that uh, they're not in a comfortable position. 
uh, where I'm still attached and doing a bit of lecturing at the Australian National University, just down the corridor are some of the world's leading climate and other scientists, and they're getting more depressed by the minute every time they come back from another committee meeting. And in my view, there is no doubt that our planet has moved into a whole new geological epoch, which they're calling the Anthropocene, human-made, uh, different to the previous 12,000 years of the Holocene, which was the ideal environment for uh, human agriculture and, and therefore civilization to evolve. <coughs> and I'm arguing, and I think the evidence is overwhelming, that uh, this makes world wars even look like storms and teacups. This, this is the greatest challenge our species has ever faced, what's now coming um, in the way we've destabilised the Earth systems. And part of that is um, what's happened post-1950, what, what they're calling the Great Acceleration. And just to give you a few examples, uh, the orange is the sort of social side. Um, we've had an exponential rise across a huge number of indicators. Population, real GDP, fertiliser consumption, uh, energy use, water use, building of large dams, so on. And on the blue side, the earth system trends, similar, almost parallel. Uh, the two are related, of course. Uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, acidification of oceans, uh, crashing in fish populations and aquaculture, that sort of stuff. So that's what's behind us destabilising the Earth systems. It's this rapidly rising human population and wealth starting to destabilise those issues. And that's what we can do. Um, that was under the Soviet era, world's fourth largest lake, bigger than Tasmania, uh, for cotton and um, irrigation. <coughs> that's, what, that's how it's ended up. So we're a pretty powerful species when we put our mind to it. Um, in 2013, I, I did a consultancy job in uh, Burma, Myanmar, for an aid organisation. And this culture had had centuries of uh, a village uh, economy and pastoralism. But even at 2013, they'd had 20 years of climate destabilisation. The monsoons come off the Indian Ocean. Monsoons have been shot to bits, um, down 40%, highly irregular. And the whole society in that landscape, that used to be a healthy grassland, it's now just um, prickly shrubs. And they're in social crisis. So uh, ask them about climate change, uh, they're not too sceptical. <coughs> So these are the um, key boundaries that we've really destabilised. Uh, if you think about the Earth, it's got nine interrelated self-organising systems that maintain that perfect conditions for life. If you go back to that blue-green planet on the left here, it's the only blue-green planet we know of in the um, entire universe, let alone the solar system. It's blue-green because life itself created conditions for life. It was about 3.2 billion years ago, bacteria first put up oxygen in the atmosphere. About 400 million years ago, it was the great forest. That, that was after fungus and algae and stuff had started to break down rocks for soil. The great forest got going and started to regulate the carbon dioxide cycle. So life has created that planet. And now we've got one species of life starting to destabilise it. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, the ones in red are now into very dangerous er areas, but climate change, biodiversity loss, we're now in the sixth greatest extinction event in the history of the Earth, this time caused by us. Uh, land system change, overuse of fresh water and so on. So, if you look at a lot of the literature, a key player in destabilising those, if not the major player, are the worst aspects of industrial agriculture. But as I'm going to argue, there's a flip side to that, which is that a, a regenerative agriculture can address that. And as I say, this is grounds for hope, because if industrial ag is one of the key players, if not the key player in some areas, a different sort of ecological regenerative ag can turn that around. So how do we get into this mess? Uh, and I'm deliberately putting a hyphen between agri and culture because it's to do with the square foot of real estate, as one farmer said, between our ears. 
And um, it's really, and I start the book early on with uh, a record of one of the early pioneers, John Robertson, coming in and in about six, seven years, totally destroying this beautiful grassland ecosystem, happened with our district as well. And what was happening, same with our area and most areas, is the destruction of what's called the small water, water cycle. <coughs> That's the cycle where um, you, you have your macro water cycle, but the, the small water cycle is the local one, where you get mists and fogs and hydrated landscapes. And, and at home, for example, as, as early diary records from the 18, uh, late 1820s and 30s of uh, heavy fogs and mists right into summer days, go for a ride on the horse, you're totally soaked from the knees down. <coughs> we then started over, over stocking, over grazing, set stocking, and eventually the plough came in. We've destroyed that small water cycle. And uh, that's the first step in going down the path of desertifying landscapes. And there's an historical precedent. Our agriculture, Western agriculture, evolved uh, in the Middle East, what's called the Fertile Crescent, that green Syria, Iraq, all those countries. <coughs> 10 or 12,000 years ago, they domesticated the first sheep and goats, and then uh, the cereal weeds, what were weedy plants, and began the uh, domestication of our cereal plants. And they were rich environments. Uh, the river deltas and valleys of the, of, uh, the Euphrates and those sort of places, uh, rich forests. Here's Plato having a whinge in 360 BC that the hills around Athens had been so overcleared they were like the skeleton of a sick man with all the bones and flesh gone. And, uh, and beautiful, diverse grasslands. <coughs> Have a look at those areas today. Syria, Iraq, Libya, top end of Africa, what's called the Sahil, Chad. They're all deserts, constant droughts, a lot of social conflict. So that's what we humans, through an inappropriate agriculture, have done. We've destroyed the small water cycle, and that's the result. <coughs> and the result in places like Australia and America, for example, was, and I just touch on this briefly in my book, is that following the Renaissance, we had that extraordinary period in Western history of uh, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, the capitalist revolution, and now the, uh, the modern current capitalist revolution of economic rationalism, constant growth for the sake of growth, which means constant destruction. But the end result of that was, if you look at those photos on the left, whether it's a medieval peasant, a Bruegel painted, or an Aboriginal or indigenous culture, they were of an organic mind where they saw themselves as indivisible from Mother Earth. What you did to the mother, you did to yourself. Didn't see themselves as separate. The time we went through that quite wonderful phase of the scientific etc. revolutions, the downside was we'd separated ourselves and we saw the Earth now as something separate from which we extracted profit in, uh, in using its resources. And that was a huge shift. And, and its consequences were very savage when we came to these new continents and the early settlers. So underneath our ancient landscape, in Western Australia up to 3.8 billion years old, and we're looking at where those early settlers came, Northwest Europe and, and England particularly, um, they were 12,000 year old landscapes in effect, post-glacial, chock full of nutrients, humid atmosphere, a lot of rain, and they come to this continent. 3.8 million year, 8, 8 billion years means not many nutrients left. And under, underneath that ancient landscape was a lot of salt. So you start clearing trees, uh, within 20, 30 years you end up with things like dry land salinity. There's now millions of hectares and it's still growing. And we did things like that. Um, and don't worry, I've, I've, I'll talk about it later, all the mistakes I made in the 80s droughts. So um, New Zealand ended up with millions of tonnes of that soil that turned their Southern Alps red. That's 4,000 kilometres from uh, pastoral country in South Australia, Broken Hill, Wimmera Mallee, etc. And, um, and we're still doing it. That was, uh, someone sent me a face Facebook picture from 2015 and, and I know in the last 12 months there's been plenty of photos of 
dust storm sweeping through. So uh, there's no small water cycle left there and there's no vegetation to hold and, and soak up moisture. So, And really, um, you can sum it up by saying that the plough and domestication of animals has created deserts around the world, as I said about the Mediterranean. So did we get it all wrong? And if you look at the stats, we've got about nearly 13 and a half billion hectares of land available for agriculture. Uh, we've pretty much destroyed already 37% of that. So we're doing something wrong, I guess is the message. And so are we in denial about this process of desertification? Desertification means taking the ground cover off the land and killing the healthy soil biology, whether it's through overgrazing, over set stocking, or too much tillage or whatever. And, and so I'm arguing powerfully um, that there is an alternative way that can not only stop the damage but can actually regenerate those functions. And uh, not just heal the earth but <laughs> address human health at the same time, which to me is incredibly exciting if you're a farmer. <coughs> and that's the key. Healthy, biologically rich and active soils. Uh, we tend not to think uh, I know I certainly did early in my career that the, the soil is just some inanimate structure that you add a few things to, but it's actually this extraordinary ecosystem of complex life, which is what drives the whole thing. And so, to me, it's clear that, uh, and there's just so much examples that I've been privileged to go and talk to the best operators around, uh, that with animals and plants, uh, we can restore our farms, ecosystems, and it can become incredibly profitable as you slash costs and run more animals, etc. And there's a whole range of ways doing it, but you can boil it down to some of the new stuff that's emerging with multi-species cover cropping, perennial cover crops, which we'll touch on briefly, and holistic grazing management of our grasslands. And uh, for all those th three key approaches, you need animals in the landscape to kickstart a process that I'll, I'll touch on later to do with the microbial world. <coughs> but the first step in turning things around has to be um, us, um, and I identify with this so strongly, uh, gaining some ecological literacy, which means understanding how the whole system functions. And I certainly didn't when I started farming and that's why I did so much damage. So the current industrial paradigm is that really nature's the enemy, we'd knock the hell out of her, chuck on chemicals or set stock or whatever, <coughs> and, and it's leading to these huge costs. And, and we're being played by the big end of town as well. That advertisement there uh, was a full page ad in Stock and Land Land, all the big rural weeklies in about 2010 for Roundup. White pointer, Roundup drum, sexy smile with sexy eyelids. Uh, in that language is stuff like trust your killer instincts. So the, the, the big multinationals are employing um, psychologists by the dozen to manipulate us. And so we've, we've become trapped in this dependence on, on inputs. Whereas what we're finding now, you can do without them uh, when you really manage properly and uh, you get a lot better results. And that, that's the other exciting thing about shifting to a natural function. So. <coughs> The, my journey was, I uh, had a merino stud, went into the 80s drought, five years at home, and um, had to defend this stud. So I put the animals first, ended up with a whacking debt, huge debt, and uh, had a dusty landscape. And I was so illiterate that I could drive past that landscape on the right and not realise it should have been in hospital and intensive care. I just couldn't read it. I was if you like, illiterate. And it's all because of that square foot of real estate between my ears at the time. That's a fence line on our Monero temperate grasslands between a neighbour on the right and another neighbour on the left. In the 80s I was on the right. I then straddled that fence, which isn't too comfortable because it's a barbed wire fence. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to think I'm now more on the left. But that's all about um, the way we're trained 
and brought up and, and come to believe things. So the key, anyone who's read any of Alan Savory and other ecologists, he talks about the four biogeophysical functions, the solar, water cycle, soil mineral cycle and, and biodiversity. Um, and that sums up really the whole natural functions. But the fifth one I've added is that weird white species there in the middle, uh, we're humans. <coughs> because whatever we do to those functions, uh, determines how healthy they are. And I just want to emphasise those arrows. You can't destabilise any one of those functions without them all being destabilised. They're all interconnected. And conversely, if you start regenerating one in particular, say you focus on trapping more water or whatever, it has a likewise benefit. But if, <coughs> if we start doing that sort of thing, <coughs> uh, it's going to affect one, if not all four of those functions in a, in a drastic way. And so all those interconnections are gone. And that's really the, the guts of uh, starting to farm ecologically and regeneratively, uh, conversely. So I'm just going to skip through these with a few examples, but I don't have to uh, emphasise that everything comes from the sun, plants photosynthesise, put sugars, leachates into the soil or, or build biomass. I see my role as a manager is to stack on as many solar panels as I can on my country for as long as I can through the year, to keep making those sugars to feed that soil biology. And, and it, so it's the key one. <coughs> and if you get it right, um, whether it's regenerative grazing or things like um, stacking multi-species into cover crops, um, you start to impact positively all those functions. And I stayed with this guy, Norman Croom, in South Africa, pretty much like the Broken Hill or worse country. Um, eight inch rain, seven inch. His country was like that paddock on the right when he first started uh, in the late 70s. He said he had to walk a kilometre to find a perennial plant. He then started holistic grazing. And with dramatic impact. That's his country today on the left. He's now more than tripled his production and got his water cycle working. And that country on the right, um, 400 years ago, before the Dutch and English started to belt it, had rivers full of hippopotami in it. And there's plenty of examples. This is um, up near uh, Bowen. Um, 100 years, top left, 100 years of overgrazing and burning. And uh, after 10 years, uh, that red arrow is the same tree in that landscape as a benchmark. So after 10 years, through shifting to ecological grazing, which means more animal impact, longer rest periods, not set stocking all the time, eating out your valuables, um, that's the change. The whole country is regenerating, uh, not just grasslands and shrubs. And that gully, when, he started, when they started, was vertical and actively eroding. Now the battens are 45 degrees and... and uh, Gullon, she told me the other day they've now got eucalypts germinating in the base of that gully. <coughs> it's dramatic if we shift. Um, these are interesting guys way up in remote company, country in the Kimberleys. No roads in there, so they got a cheap lease. You've got to fly in. Uh, that top right was what it was like due to feral donkeys and cattle for generations. And as he says, bottom left, just through a few key tools, animal impact, human ingenuity, solar energy, that's the same valley, bottom right, as what you can see above. So it's quite dramatic when you start to shift. And I won't belabor this, this is another bit of country just um, on the Fitzroy River, just north of um, Rockhampton. If you go left to right and then left to right again, you can see the shift in only seven years to the 2013 wet season, from where they were in 2006. That was 150 years of set stocking and too much burning. It was rock hard, that country. You can imagine the water pouring off in a big rain. Uh, and they've turned it round just by changing up here, I guess. <coughs> um, I think, there's, there's, yeah, that's good. <laughs> the shift to ecological grazing 
uh, implies a whole mind shift. You start to re-engage with your landscape. You become a lot more observant about what's going on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In, instead of just re treating it as an inanimate object, you start to identify. And you've, if you're into holistic grazing and, and multi-species cropping, whatever, where you need animals, um, it's a constant iteration, and it makes life ten times more interesting. <coughs> but that's the key. And the new cropping approaches um, can't regenerate soils with some of the tremendous results they're getting without using animals in them. So there's pasture and cover cropping, which is really where you combine grazing and cropping and uh, manage your country in a way that benefits each. I'm sure some of you have heard Colin Sice and others. I was privileged last year to work with Gay Brown in America, who's really pioneering stuff over there. And I'll show you in a minute. Um, so cover cropping uses a diverse annual crop to create mulch, control weeds and improve soil health, and to cover the ground and build fertility for the next crop. But to maximise soil health, you've got to have animals grazing that system and laying down the cover before, in many cases, go in with coulter discs or something to drill the next year's cereal or whatever. It's all about building soil fertility and protecting that soil. So pasture cropping, which Colin Sice is famous for developing, perennial cover cropping technique, where you drill your cereals, just as the, 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 what are called the um, summer active carbon four grasses, just when they go dormant going into the cropping season, the planting season, drill in your crop, graze it a few times, and then um, when it's ready for harvest, you've taken off the uh, grain just as the, the, the your summer active grasses are waking up. So you're extending your growth period and your ground cover um, so much longer into the year. And so the animals aren't sort of a nuisance in a cropping system or, or a grazing system. They're actually multifunctional tools. Uh, they're rumen uh, with similar microbes, etc., in it to the soil, are uh, inoculating soil. Uh, walking fertiliser machines, foot massaging, and, uh, and of course mowing. And if, if you run these guys correctly, they're going to do that multifunction to regenerate your country. Quickly moving on to the second cycle, which is the water cycle, because if you get a solar energy cycle going and you get a healthy soil, you're going to hold a thousand times more water in that soil, which is what's happened here. This is a ranch in Mexico. That blue arrow is the same point in that landscape. Uh, and that's 27 years apart. Again, like those Queensland examples, that country was so overgrazed, so hard, all the water ran off, so it's sitting in the bottom here. On the right today, it's probably um, 1,000 times, 10,000 times more water in that landscape. It's just not visible. And you would have all seen this. <coughs> Plenty of uh, photos, but that was a um, uh, over three inch storm in two hours. Uh, more regeneratively managed country on the left, no runoff. On the right, um, Nigel Kerriner gave me that photo, estimated that uh, the farmer on the right probably lost two thirds of that rain because it was so hard and compacted it all poured off. And, and it all comes down to getting deeper roots and greater soil structure. But to get that, it requires a different sort of active management. I'm not going to belabor too many of these things, but if you think about modern industrial cropping, um, and we now know in Australia and, and in America there's now a hard pan developed because there's no either perennial roots or forbs going uh, any deeper than where that hard pan uh, now sits. Uh, whereas a paddock on the right that's grazed or cropped differently uh, you can see the roots working their, their way down, and that has a huge impact on water absorption in the soil and soil health. And I, I know when I first uh, read the science on this, it gave me a bit of a shock, but um, destruction of cover by tillage and overgrazing is the main cause of desertification. And here, one sp splash erosion on a bare soil believe it or not, delivers more compaction than tillage. 
Um, so the secret is don't get that soil bed uh, for a whole range of reasons, um, which we'll touch on in a minute. Now this is a photo of American Prairie um, in its original state. So you've got a diversity of Forbes annuals, C3, C4 grasses, all different depths, all doing different things. We start shifting to a simplistic way of farming and that's the hard pan that develops and you lose that benefit underneath, not just the food for all your soil bugs, but all your water absorbency and soil health. And a, and a quick rule of thumb that uh, a lot of the holistic grazing teachers talk about is try not to take uh, more than about 50% of your active grass. Try and take 50% and then lay the rest down if you can, because once you get over the 50%, your root die-off goes up exponentially. You want some little bit of root die-off to feed your bugs, but uh, not to that disastrous extent where the first rain you get, the poor old plant has to start right from scratch. <coughs> and this is an example again of the American prairie, but uh, uh, that's actually the first perennial plant that they're now getting um, products from, beer and, and a bit of um, cere uh, cereal flour. But that shows you the difference um, between why industrial cereals, which are shallow rooted, I mean after all they're good old annual plants whose so job is just to drop a lot of seed and not worry about going down deep and sourcing nutrients. But that's part of the issue of, um, of, of not using a diverse multi-species cropping uh, with your cereal enterprises. <coughs> I'm just going to quickly run you through, um, I've just come back from America at a conference and uh, became friendly with this guy, Alejandro, who farms in uh, this desert that crosses into Texas as well as Mexico and that, that used to be grazed there, that's why they've got a fence there. <coughs> and I'll just quickly flip you through, I mean we, you can get spectacular results with grazing in subtropical and temperate areas with rainfall like uh, we all experience, in, in theory anyway, uh, when we get the rain. But what these guys are doing in deserts uh, is quite remarkable. So that's what it looks like. It used once to have uh, millions of buffalo grazing over it, just like North America and Canada. Uh, and then set stocking and overgrazing has led to this situation. Bed off the uh, nourishing deep rooted plants. And it's the same applies here and, and in Africa and uh, South America. So it's a, it's a common example. Deep gullies. Uh, pretty horrendous stuff. It was never like that. It was covered in healthy grasslands before um, they settled it earlier than uh, North America, but um, it's a pretty similar pattern. And now they're doing that in that same country. Um, and through using large mobs of cattle, high density, long rests. If we have time tomorrow, I'll show you a, a brief vi video on it. And, Really, that's the secret. Once, and we, in our case, it was about the 1870s, we got industrial fencing wire, enabled us to build paddocks, shove the stock in there and leave them. So set stocking was really exacerbated by those technologies because um, we didn't understand holistic grazing. And uh, if you talk to some of the ecologists working in landscape ecology, they talk about uh, resilience theory, that once you've degraded a landscape, you drop it down to a lower level. It's not going to regenerate itself without a huge injection of energy of some sort. And so the national, Alan Savory, for example, has been building his head against rangeland scientists for 50 years uh, who despise him because he's got a solution. And, and they, they say we've got to lock these, rain, these national parks up, but they never improve. They stay like that because you, you've got to do what these Mexican graziers are doing and some in Australia and Africa, and that's put animals and energy into the system. And there's some good examples in Australia of ponding out in the semi-arid country, holding water with a bit of vegetable matter, but it's only healing small pockets. Uh, and it's, the same's happening in Mexico. It's not changing broad landscapes. That's the African herd, and I've deliberately put that sort of artistic representation on the right there to show you that these big herds, it's not just animal impact and urine and dung, there's, there's energy going in. And that's really the secret that, uh, that, that's savoury and then later um, 
Stan Parsons and people like uh, Terry McCosker and others are brought to Australia. <coughs> and the bison were doing the same in, in, uh, in America, Canada, America, uh, United States and Mexico. And people say to me, yeah, but Australia didn't have um, any of these animals. Well, we, we actually had um, megafauna and, until the last big wipeout about 50,000 years ago. But we've got quite a few African grasses, <coughs> light seeds that have come over. And that's why holistic grazing is also working in Australia. <coughs> the same principles apply. So that's uh, Alejandro's property on the right. Um, only six inches of rain last summer, probably sound familiar to all of us in the room at the moment. Um, and that's just traditional management, set stocking, and uh, this new ecological grazing on the right. <coughs> and so the, the, the simple message is we need these large mobs judiciously managed, giving the country rest and, and density impact, and that's behind the holistic grazing revolution. And they're also doing this. This is in that desert country. <coughs> he, took, he had um, spot sites of um, cow manure. And those guys, dung beetles bearing it. And research over there and elsewhere shows about two thirds of those cow pats are going into the soil to start build the soil biology and, and nutrients. So that's the end of that <coughs> and the water cycle. So um, this is the key one, of course, other than solar. Um, and they're all key, but. Um, <coughs> I know from my point of view, this is the one that I ignored, the, the role of a healthy, diverse soil ecology. Uh, and that's the key, biologically active soil ecology. So soil microbes and other soil life, they need plants for food. And the natural world's composed of these interdependent communities of organisms. It works it, all through nature, so why should we simplify it? Uh, in what we're doing. And um, so the plants feed on the root exudates from the bugs. I'm uh, uh, sorry, the, the plants release the exudates which feeds the bugs. Uh, and that's how the whole system works. It, it goes around in a circle. And, and a rough analogy, what we should be aiming for is having that iceberg look. We, we should have a lot more life underground than the equivalent weight of our livestock sitting on top. That's what healthy soils are, extraordinarily full of life. <coughs> uh, unlike that, that was healthy, diverse prairie. 20 foot deep roots, a uh, bit of overgrazing and, and, uh, and then over, put the plough in and then droughts hit. Straight into desert and that's what the American Dust Bowl was all about. So that's the key, <coughs> this healthy soil food web across the whole spectrum. That's, that's the gold mine we've got to nurture. And particularly things like the, uh, <coughs> the root fungus, the microhazel fungi. There's a few varieties we won't go into, but um, if you don't have them, you've got plants that look like that. Um, if you've got the root fungi, they're microtubes, you can't see them, called hyphae. Uh, they're the guys that have a partnership with the plants. Plants release the sugars, release the sugars. Their part of the bargain is to go out and source the nutrients for the plant. Uh, can be up to, in a square metre of soil, cubic metre of soil, could be up to 25,000 kilometres of those microtubes working away for you. Uh, and the nutrients they bring in are what goes into healthy food. That's the equivalent of a, a cubic metre of that small ute. If we then go in and spray, overgraze, over-fertilise, uh, we kill off that fungi. And you're left with your drug addict cereals waiting for their dose of NPK, etc. And, and those nutrients are not getting in to the plants and into, uh, into our food. It's, uh, these microhazel fungi are incredibly special guys, but they're all playing a role in there. Uh, and they play a multiplicity of roles as well. Um, the other bugs in the soil love them and uh, they can be pretty aggressive on uh, dangerous nematodes, etc, etc. So they're, they're worth nourishing. <coughs> mm. 
in uh, 2011, I was cutting across the head of the Liverpool Plains. And uh, I'm just reflecting on that dust bowl in America, see, let alone our sort of Mallee, Wimmera droughts. Um, it was a dry season, about eight mils of rain, uh, 12 hours before I took this photo. So I came through the next morning, and th these are some of the best soils in Australia, and I stopped. Hopped over the fence behind the railway line and had a look, and those soils were totally dead, thick crust. They'd been so overplowed, over fertilised, overworked. That rain should have gone in five, ten minutes, and it's sitting there 12 hours later. So, um, no soil biology, no depth, no structure, no aggregation uh, of the soil particles. <clears throat> and if you've got no cover on your soil, um, I guess you guys that identify with 41 degrees centigrade as well this last summer, we had our first 40 degree in the Monero. Um, and there's been hotter stuff out in the cropping zones of the Riverina, etc. But only you get down uh, half a centimetre, you get this baking effect. And your soil temperature goes up to over 60 degrees centigrade. Well, that kills any biology under that soil. So cover is so critical uh, in cropping and grazing. And these guys have just come out of left field. Um, you guys would laugh at that soil. It's pretty much beach sand, uh, literally in, in uh, the, the northern cropping zone of Western Australia. They, uh, and they're big croppers. Uh, in the last um, nine years, which has mainly been drought, when uh, well over 60, 70% of the wheat belt in the West has gone into big debt, these guys have grown from 600 acres to 30,000. And they've developed a new form of agriculture that's eliminated industrial chemicals at the point of sowing. And, and Ian uses big modern machinery, he's just adapted it. And he won't hop in a tractor unless he's doing well over 120, 30 hectares in a day. Um, at the point of sowing, they wrap uh, worm juice and compost extract around the seed and have eliminated their inputs. And, um, and they graze it with sheep uh, through the winter and they're getting quite remarkable results. That's why they've grown their business when everyone else has gone into big debt for the wrong reasons. <laughs> and so that's this photo here. That shows their neighbour on the left, traditional cropping. This is just after harvest. Had a bit of a, a green summer that year. That's Haggerty's place on the right. So through that ecological approach, they're starting to get perennials and stuff that the agronomists said didn't exist in Western Australia. So you can see Top right, the neighbour's paddock, um, that's about to go through five, six months of Western Australian summer with hot temperatures. That's pretty typical. I remember visiting clients uh, when I had ram clients in the West and they'd, they'd fill up the silos in November and then feed out because it was all bare. And that's Haggerty's on the bottom, um, 40 metres across the fence line. And so they're grazing uh, that country uh, through the summer and putting down carbon and all the rest of it versus the more um, traditional approach in the West. <coughs> so you can imagine how the soil's building in respective cases. And so this, this is what this country on the left looks like. A friend of mine, Phil Lee's got a wonderful microscope over there and um, you won't find any really valuable uh, microhazal fungi or the, the, the wonderful stuff they make and other bugs make like glomalin and stuff. It's pretty much bare roots. <coughs> same day, same sample across the fence. You can't see any roots with the uh, Haggerty's soil. It's covered in sticky goo and uh, the, 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 the hyphae and the other bugs have made. And um, that essentially sums up the difference. Encouraging soil life, which is the secret, versus killing it. <coughs> I won't go into the details, but the Haggerty soil is it's full of it's what you call well-aggregated soil, about 50% of air pockets in there, allowing the roots to go down to store water and all the rest of it. And uh, it's sort of no-brainer stuff once you learn it, and I, and I, I was ignorant of it for, for too, far too long. So what's the next step in recreating soil health? Well, it's what I indicated before. It's this, what's now sweeping America and some of the parts of Australia. Uh, multi-species pasture and cover cropping. <coughs> so depending on where you are, you have a range of, of multi-species. It looks like you need a minimum 12 or 13 to get this synergistic takeoff. 
and they're all doing different things, from legumes to deep rooted forbs to brassicas to cereals putting sugar in uh, for your bacteria and others. If you look at bottom right, if you graze it and lay down some cover, uh, come harvest time you can take off a cereal harvest over the top of that and that's how it's working and guys like Gay Brown in the States now pioneering it way up in the prairies in North Dakota is getting four or five hundred emails a day from farmers who are hitting the wall under the industrial system there. And this is Gay Brown, I, I did a gig with him last year in the States, uh, extraordinary innovator and you can see how he's drilled his cereal on the right there into ground that's covered that the animals have laid down, these animals bottom left. And the animals are fertilising and, and, and creating impact and all the rest of it. So that's one of his tools, um, but he's got basic, five basic principles for soil health. And this guy's a really serious cropper. Uh, disturb the soil as little as possible. Try and get 100% uh, cover on it, he calls it armour. Uh, you need a huge diversity of plants and animals. He uses not just cattle, but pigs and other stuff. You don't have to, but um, diversity is one of the great words in ecology. Uh, you want your living roots as long as possible, punching in the sugars for the soil. And you've got to have those animals into the system. So you're actually stacking in another enterprise that's benefiting the whole thing. <coughs> and he took this sample, um, that's what his soil, that, that, uh, compacted soil on top of that shovel, that's what his soil was like um, uh, before he began about 12 years ago. And underneath that shovel, underneath that compacted soil is his own soil and, and uh, the neighbour soil was 40 metres through the fence and he said that's what mine was like. You can see Gabe's soil, you can see the aggregation on the earthworms. My guess if, if you got a penetrometer out and pushed it in, the compacted soil on the top would be at least a thousand psi and I would imagine Gabe's is two or three hundred psi. Huge difference in water absorbency, uh, all because the biology is working in one and it's dead in the other. And just quickly summarising, um, his soil uh, inf water infiltration, uh, when he, just before he shifted in 91, um, he was getting about half an inch water ab absorbency in, in an hour. After 11 years of his cover cropping, that had gone up to 10 inches an hour and he tested it the other day. Uh, he's now getting one inch in nine seconds and the second inch uh, in 16 seconds. It's, it's that absorbent soil with the aggregation. So you can imagine you get a big rain event, um, it's sort of no-brainer stuff really. You're, uh, you're totally changing your whole ecology and, and uh, pastoral cropping ec economy. <coughs> A lot of what we're talking about is putting carbon in the soil to feed the bugs, and, but also carbon that becomes long-lasting. And uh, there's plenty of research, including this in Australia, that if you put just 1% more carbon in your soil, uh, that soil can store uh, at least an extra 144,000 litres per hectare, which was obvious in his water penetration rates. So it, it, it's, uh, that's what soil biology does for us. <coughs> So what's really happening um, in the soil, it's, the soil is no different to any other ecology. It, it's full of complex communities, uh, species rich, diverse, uh, and they're all interacting and abundant. So why do we think that underground's any different to bush paddock uh, or diverse pastures above ground? And, and, and so why do we destroy that complexity? I remember ploughing a lovely basalt and, and uh, red granite country without knowing what I was doing. So soil organic carbon, it's, it's the key driver. You've got to have that um, alive biology, giving you aggregation and, and all the life that comes with it. So how do we, we get there? Uh, you need that animal density, because we're talking about changing soils, you get to this tipping point, which I'm going to touch on briefly in a minute. Uh, you either have diverse grasslands or this diverse multi-species cropping approach. And once you get to that critical mass, if you've done that uh, uh, just long enough at the right, in the right way, we get this remarkable self-organisation and sort of a tipping point that occurs. 
which leads to really rapid soil building. And uh, that's got a name, it's called quorum sensing. I mean, it wasn't until uh, Christine Jones and other soil scientists started to interact with microbiologists, they said, yeah, well, we've known about this quorum sensing business for the last 15 years or more, and, and we've now put the picture together. Um, we now know that between the plant and the soil is extraordinary communication through chemical language. Uh, and actually that communication, this is a mind-blowing uh, information that's emerging. Uh, we have this communication across the animal kingdoms, phyla, genuses, species. So plants are talking to microbes, microbes are talking to us across the whole spectrum. So it's a real brain rattling thought that we're not, they're not talking in Latin, French or English, they're talking in chemistry, hormones, uh, pheromones, um, enzymes and stuff like that. Uh, but that's the basis to this flip or turning point that the, the, the soil biologists uh, call quorum sensing. So as we build soil, we get uh, this desirable biology and if you get enough of it and do the right thing, you get this tipping point. So uh, these microhazel fungi I spoke about, by and large, the more of them you got, the more the other bugs love the whole situation. I'm not going to get into the detail, I just want to throw this idea at you of why we get this tipping point and this extraordinary quick turnover. Essentially, in this case, this plant is short of nitrogen. So it's released a chemical signal uh, flavonoids in this case, sort of a hormone compound, which bacteria in the soil have picked up and the rhizobia form nodules, grab some nitrogen, resolves that. There's this communication going and the same happens uh, with disease. <coughs> so, like I'm saying, I don't want you to get too hung up um, on, on a huge amount of research from the microbiological world, but that communication is across the spectrum. And this quorum sensing thing that they're talking about, this tipping point, is when we develop rich biodiversity above the plants and below the ground. And that's when you get this sort of magic result that builds soil like Gay Brown uh, was just showing us. Uh, and again, don't get hung up on this, but this is an example of what happens. Uh, you haven't got enough density in the soil here because it's not uh, had the right uh, management or conditions, but eventually when you get that middle one, you get the density. Uh, in this case, um, there's been a, uh, a viral attack on one of the roots in the plant. They form what's called a biofilm. The message has gone from the plant, I'm being attacked, and the attack uh, bacteria have come in and knocked it over. What's going on underneath is that bacteria are switching on and off plant genes to help in fighting the disease. And I'll touch on that a bit later. That's called epigenetics. Uh, we're only just discovering this remarkable stuff going on underneath. And so just to summarise it up, um, quorum sensing, complex communication with all the bugs and, and across the species under the ground, you've got to get to this critical tipping point which we as managers create, whether it's grazing or cropping, and, uh, and that communication is across the spectrum. It's sort of mind-blowing stuff, but it's the first explanation now we know why you get those transformations in the desert, with grazing uh, and some of the remarkable stuff that Haggerty's and people like that are getting. So we do that, uh, what are the chances of us getting tipping points uh, with that sort of an operation? Uh, no quorum sensing in those soils. So just quickly, um, that the, I'm not going to touch on this too much, um, even though it's equally important, the role of biodiversity and pests and insect and plant, except for diversity. Um, uh, the land care groups around Australia have been fantastic and the CMA is in developing this. Uh, and we just haven't got time today, I just want to put it up there as one of the key factors and I could give you dozens of examples. Um, but I won't, um, just because of time. So I was going to say um, we have a smoke out break, but uh, how are we going, Jack, do you think? Will we keep rolling? I don't want to put everyone to sleep too quickly, but is it too, too early for a break? We're going okay for time? Why don't we have a 10 minute break? Quick break? Yep. yep.